This is on assignment. Hi, I'm Alex Villarreal, here with Imran Siddiqui, and we're taking you on assignment. Our first stop, North Korea, as the VOA goes inside Pyongyang to talk with citizens in the reclusive state. Barack Obama's rival for the White House is nearly official. We look at the 2012 U.S. presidential race. And an American television genre fights off extinction. We'll go to Los Angeles. These are the stories behind the stories, so join us as we go on assignment. We begin in North Korea, which recently marked 100 years since the birth of its founding leader, Kim Il-sung. The anniversary took place just four months after the death of his son and successor, Kim Jong-il. And now, Kim Jong-il's son, Kim Jong-un, has taken over as the leader of the communist country. VOA Korean service reporter Song won Baek traveled to Pyongyang to talk to North Koreans about these milestones. Let's check out what he had to say. There was never much doubt that one of Kim Jong-il's sons would become the next leader of North Korea. Kim Jong-un won the blessing to be the Kim to continue the dynasty. So tell me something, how did you get into North Korea? A lot of foreign journalists, maybe like 50 or 60 journalists all over the world, including um, VOA and you know, other main um, U.S. Uh, the medias were invited. And it is the grandson Kim Jong-un who is perhaps the greatest beneficiary during the celebration of Kim Il-sung's birthday. I am firmly resolved to swear my loyalty to our Supreme Commander Kim Jong-un throughout my entire life. What about those interviews that you took? They're pretty fascinating interviews. How controlled were the interviews? I was relatively freely um, approached to the people. It is not only soldiers who pledge allegiance to the young leader. Ordinary citizens laud him as a confident leader. I was really surprised when I first saw him. Before, I could only see him on TV or newspaper. I was totally overwhelmed with joy, and I was so relieved to have him as a leader. I was the, one of the very few um, foreign journalists who spoke their language, Korean language, of course. So I was more kind of being paid attention by the officials there. So um, whenever I wanted to or tried to uh, talk to people, uh, not only my minder, but also other minders were accompanied by. The hailed but ultimately failed missile launch, which North Korea hoped would be a show of mighty military force, opened up a few cracks for outsiders to peer into the inner workings of North Korean society. The specific question was, how do they think about their missile launching? But the very young lady started talking about this is not a missile, but a satellite, and it is a peaceful purpose, which was, which sounded a bit unnatural, and the more importantly, she constantly um, keep picking into her note. This young lady struggled to follow instructions when asked about the controversial launch. So are you aware of criticism that the launch is a cover for a test of long-range missile technology? Yes, I heard so, but it's wrong. How did you learn about the criticism? Well, our satellite is not a long-range missile. It's a peaceful satellite observing the Earth. The interesting thing is that if it's an ordinary citizen or the officials, their answer was extremely the same. I heard a couple of people say that they're pretty optimistic about the future in terms of economic development. In the past, we have a record that the past leaderships couldn't pull it off. So why do the people still have the sense that the economic condition of North Korea will get better? Many North Koreans believe it is Kim Jong-un who makes it possible for North Korea to achieve prosperity in economy military prowess, and the advancement of science and technology. One even told VOA that apple trees bear fruit 
thanks to the exceptional leadership of Kim Jong-un. Who in the leadership would look after this little farm? Kim Jong-un is such an exceptional leader who takes care of his people. What was that about? Was that about... uh, 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 was that a depiction of the overall economy of North Korea that now we have a new leadership so the apple trees will start bearing fruit or was that just her particular example? That apple tree comment was not just metaphor. Um, It was kind of symbolic reaction of North Korean um, people. They especially put an emphasis on the the on-site guidance of the leaders. That means that they the leaders visit the specific farms or, or factories or any production, um, the facilities. They believe that all the problems would be solved. That's their mindset. At least they say that, that it is. Okay. Well, great job. Love the story. Thank you so much for your time and good Thank luck you to much, your everyone. future Thanks projects. For having me. Here in the United States, the 2012 race for the White House is heating up for the two major parties. The Republican candidate set to take on Democrat Barack Obama is all but official. Mitt Romney, a former businessman and state governor, has swept aside virtually everyone who challenged him for his party's nomination. But Mr. Romney won't formally become the nominee until later this year. But the campaigning for president is already underway. I talked with VOA's Jim Malone for the inside scoop. Let's roll that tape. Look, Mitt Romney's Republican rivals have basically ceded the field to him at this point. It turned out that Romney's huge fundraising capabilities, uh, his organization strengths, uh, they all helped him in the end defeat his Republican rivals. Even though the conventions won't come till later this year where they'll be officially uh, nominated, uh, Romney can now take the luxury of focusing all his time on uh, President Barack Obama and his record. The one thing that's probably going to unify the conservatives is President Obama and a desire among Republicans to see him defeated for a second term. And do you think this is a good time for Mitt Romney to hunt for the vice presidential candidate? Yes, uh, they have the luxury again of time. One of the things that's done in this period is names are floated. Uh, It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be chosen. But it's a political way to get someone named out there. Or it could be someone that we have no idea about. Absolutely. You know, like if you go back to uh, John McCain, he chose uh, someone pretty controversial. Do you think Mitt Romney's going to keep that in mind? Yes, I I think he's going to keep that in mind very much. But maybe not in the way we think. I think it's probably going to be a template not to repeat in 2012. We're going to Washington to shake things up. The Palin pick for McCain kind of hurt him in the end. And uh, it raised questions about how serious John McCain was about finding someone who was ready to assume the presidency. Most of the analysts I talk to now say Romney's going to avoid that path. What do you think are the advantages or disadvantages for picking up uh, a vice presidential candidate? I think the first thing you hear about, especially from these political strategists you talk to, they like to use the Hippocratic Oath for doctors do no harm. Pick someone who's not going to hurt you. McCain did not follow that advice in 2008 and it did hurt him. So we're probably going to find someone who's reasonably well known, who has experience in government. But the issue there is over, over history, vice presidential selections don't help that much. What's he going to do about his lack of experience of foreign policy? Well, I think what he's going to, of course, try to highlight, he's already been doing it is flaws that he sees in the record of President Obama on foreign policy. He's criticized him for being weak, say, on Iran's efforts to get nuclear capability. We must not allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon. If I'm president, that will not happen. If we reelect Barack Obama, it will happen. And also on uh, other issues to do with China and Russia, he says the administration has not been tough enough in dealing with those countries. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The last thing China wants is a trade war. We don't want one either. And we'll be right. But but they sell us this much stuff. We sell them this much stuff. Tell me, who doesn't want the trade war? The problem for Romney is that on foreign policy issues, uh, Barack Obama gets pretty good marks from the American people. A lot of it uh, was the the killing of Osama bin Laden. The United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden. The Obama campaign has not been shy about reminding everybody about that issue. 
Let's suppose uh, Mitt Romney does get the nod from the Republican Party and he is the presidential nominee. What do you think will be the issues that President Obama and Mitt Romney will be fighting about or arguing about? I think first and foremost is how to get the country back on its feet economically. When a, an incumbent president runs for re-election, first and foremost, it is a referendum on the incumbent. Do, do you think the president of the United States going into re-election wants gas prices to go up higher? The people are being that, asked, do you want to rehire this person for another four years? The Obama administration will go to great lengths to point out that there have been some improvements. The unemployment rate has come down a little bit. Uh, there are shoots of success in the economy that they hope to build on. And if you give us another four years, we'll make it better. And we certainly, they will also argue, don't want to go back to the way it was under President George W. Bush in terms of the economy. But the Romney campaign will make a strong argument that uh, people are generally not happy with the economy. Uh, the polls have shown they're not uh, that thrilled with President Obama's handling of the economy. So they know they have a potential weakness there for the president that they're going to try to exploit. They're going to try to make it purely about the Obama record. That'll be the basic dynamic in the campaign moving ahead. And it really will be decided by the state of the economy, but perhaps more importantly, how the average American feels about his or her life and where the, the economy and the country is headed. Thanks to VOS Jim Malone. The Republican Party's National Nominating Convention begins August 27th in Tampa Bay, Florida. Coming up, we've got the story of some of Italy's long-lost art returned unharmed. You have to see it to believe it. Stay with us. This is the Voice of America. VOA Special English, a way to learn American English and much more. Broadcasting news and features around the world on radio, television, and on the web at voaspecialenglish.com. For 50 years, helping people understand world events and the language and culture of America. The Voice of America is offering online English lessons. The Classroom is Voice of America's new online English classroom. From the VOA homepage, click on Learning English and then click on the Classroom to start learning English. In the Classroom, you will find current news articles with customized English language lessons, English language activities for beginning, intermediate, and advanced English speakers, interactive word books and dictionaries under the Interactive Learning tab, and English programs showing you how English is really spoken, and English lessons available for teachers all over the world to use in their classrooms. Learn English with Voice of America. Click on the classroom to start learning English today. It's a tale of lost and found. In April, the United States returned seven stolen and smuggled artifacts to their rightful Italian owners. The U.S. Homeland Security Secretary returned them in a ceremony at the Italian Embassy, and VOA's Carolyn Persuti was there and joins us now in studio. Welcome, Carolyn. Thanks, Alex. Good to be here. So what's the role of DHS in retrieving artifacts like this? Well, basically, it's their arm called the Immigration and Customs Enforcement that does research about what art has been stolen and brought to this country. And in the past five years, they've recovered 2,500 pieces of art, and they've delivered them back to 23 different foreign countries. Wow, that's an incredible number, and I know we are all excited to see this art for ourselves, so let's take a look at Carolyn's piece. It's a beauty, Zeus, seen here as a swan, seducing a woman. A rare oil-on-copper painting 
from the 16th century artist Lelio Orsi, auctioned off in Manhattan for $1.6 million. But Leda and the Swan was smuggled into the U.S. through false customs documents. Thursday at Italy's embassy in Washington, Orsi's Renaissance painting was returned to the Italian people. Italian ambassador Claudio Bisognero. Criminals should have no illusion. Uh, Italy and the United States are firmly together in this effort and are strongly committed to combating these crimes. Orsi's artwork wasn't the only treasure. Italy's National Police Force, the Carabinieri, tipped off U.S. Customs agents to six more antiquities, each priceless to so, Renato uh, Mirico, the embassy's cultural attaché. This double-faced marble is from the first the century. When you are just a lucky day, you put just a young face. When you are not lucky day, we, you, you, you can see just the, the other part of the sculpture. Someone ripped these pages from choir books dating back to 13th century churches and monasteries. These ceramic urns, looted from archaeological sites, are some 2,500 years old. Officials linked the sculpture and urns to a retired antiquities dealer accused of running an international smuggling organization. The pages were found on a rare book website based in the northwestern state of Oregon. Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano. On behalf of the United States government and personally as the granddaughter of immigrants from a small town near Naples, it gives me great pride to return them to you. All right, we're back with Carolyn Pursuti. Carolyn, what's next for these pieces? Well, all the pieces are returned to the small Italian villages and the small museums where they once were displayed. But it's fascinating to find out exactly how they travel there. There are special styrofoam crates that they're molded for each individual piece. And then the Carabinieri, the National Italian Police Force, escorts all the pieces back to Italy on their own private cargo jet. Wow, how interesting. Yes, All right. fascinating. Thank you, Carolyn. We're taking another break now, but when we come back, why a former fan favorite of TV entertainment is now struggling to stay on the air. You're watching On Assignment. Border Crossings is on the air. Thanks for your way, music mix. When I come in in the morning, I'll go to my um, computer and I'll check our email to see what requests have come in over the night. This is how we start the show. This one is from Rwanda. His request is for If I Had You by Anna, Adam Lambert. I'm looking up Adam Lambert, to Adam, Adam Lambert singer. Singer by request for Kumator Abo, who is joining us in Rwanda. This will be cut 12 in CD1. Cut 12. My role is director of Border Crossing, so I make sure everything flows in the studio as the show is happening okay. live. We might have to add a Beatles tune at the end. We're just a little bit short. Okay, perfect. I don't and even what know do what's do? on the show until Larry brings the bucket, like tomorrow's. He'll bring today's and place it in front of me. It's totally an unscripted show. This is Border Crossings. I'm in the process of getting the songs ready that I'm going to be playing on today's show. You've held your breath. She and now you can exhale. It is a party stuff. town, and if you've ever been to party town... <laughs> I'm Larry London on the Border Crossings. Good morning, Border Crossings. Yeah, what is your name, sir? I take phone requests. I go to the studio every day. Wolfer? I get calls okay, well, from everywhere, from China, just, you know, all over. Lee's great to work with. He's got experience in broadcasting as a DJ. He used to host his own radio show. I've put together some uh, language service IDs where I've used so the resources of VOA to go around to the different language services, and they make great segues between songs. Social Tennessee Border Crossings, Uji. In London and Border Crossings, we're going to be tomorrow right here on The Voice of America. Have a great day, and I'll see you in 23 hours. Daily daytime dramas known as soap operas were once a staple of American television, but today they're disappearing from TV lineups. Just four of these shows remain on U.S. networks. VOA's Los Angeles correspondent Mike O'Sullivan talked to the cast of one of them, and Imran, I talked to Mike about what he learned. Like sands through the hourglass, 
So are the days of our lives. The shows are called soap operas, after the laundry detergent companies that once sponsored them. Days of Our Lives recounts the lives, loves, triumphs, and tragedies of residents of a fictional town, Salem. Brian DeTillo plays Lucas Horton. He says the show has fans worldwide. Yeah, we're, we're big in a lot of places, Australia, South Africa. But soap operas face shrinking audiences and growing competition, says TV critic Brian Lowry of the entertainment publication Variety. Women especially, who were pro the predominant audience for daytime soaps, are no longer home. Mike, what's caused this decline in the soap operas? It used to be in the 30s and 40s when soap operas got started on radio and later in the 60s and 70s when they were big on television that uh, women uh, generally stayed home, housewives. Doug, maybe the thing to do is to call David. At this hour? Yes, at this hour. Make arrangements to see him first thing in the morning. I think you should talk to him before Ellen does. Uh, most women, or an awful lot of women, are out of the house today uh, working, and uh, so they've lost that audience. But the second reason is cost uh, and the competition. There uh, are a lot of uh, reality shows, uh, game shows, talk shows on television, and they can get sometimes double the, the audience share of a soap opera, and they're just a lot cheaper to produce, so they make more profit for the networks. Now, in terms of the actors on these soaps, in past decades, it seemed like we got a lot of big stars from soap operas like Demi Moore, Susan Lucci. Everything I do is breaking news. The devil are you? America King! America King! Don't. And that doesn't seem to be happening as much talk. anymore. Why is that? Yeah, is it that sure. networks are not wanting to promote these stars anymore? Well, one of the reasons is that there are far fewer soaps on the air. Uh, in the 1970s, we had a peak of 19. Uh, now we're down to just four of them. And the other point is that uh, it often takes, uh, you know, several decades for a star to move from a soap uh, into uh, other types of television and film and make a name for himself or herself. So we've got people like Morgan Freeman, uh, Kevin Bacon, Demi Moore who have come out of the soaps, but it didn't happen right away. And we've got some very talented people on the remaining soaps who could end up as A-list uh, Hollywood stars in a few years if the soaps can survive. You talked to some of those actors actually from one of the few remaining soaps on air, Days of Our Lives. What did they tell you? What are they concerned about? Well, they're all a little worried. They're all a little nervous, but they have taken some dramatic measures to try to keep their show on the air. One is to reduce costs by almost uh, 50%. So the production schedule is compressed. People are working very intensely. Uh, as people told me, there's no messing around on the set. It's just uh, one scene after another. They used to shoot one episode a day. Now they shoot seven episodes in five days. And so they say they think they've got to a point where with their audience of uh, two, three, four million people in the U.S. and an overseas audience as well, that they're cost effective and the networks will keep them on the air. Talking about the overseas audience for soaps, in Latin America you still have a pretty large following for their soap operas. What's different between there and here? Well, you know, uh, people on the American soaps point to Latin America and the telenovelas, uh, which are wildly popular, and other countries have, have their version of soaps too. Now, American soaps are a little bit different. They're daytime, they're not evening, and uh, they are uh, continuing, and the, the storylines continue uh, year after year with often the same characters, whereas in, uh, in Latin America, they might run a story for three or four months, and then they start a new story. But American soap uh, actors say, you know, there, there is a market, and um, you know, Latin America just proves that. I also wanted to ask you, what drove you to, to do this story? Well, you know, it, it started uh, accidentally because I uh, was doing a story about a small professional theater in a, one section of L.A., Pasadena, and I met a very interesting guy who, has, uh, uh, who does com uh, community theater, 
but in his day job is acting on a soap on Days of Our Lives. And he's been doing that for uh, 30 years. Now he's had his ups and downs, he's died on the series, he was shot at one point and miraculously brought back to life. <laughs> right. He was the uh, police chief at one point and after he came back to the show, when he was actually off in another series for two years, but he was ridden back into the script and he became the uh, mayor of the town. So, uh, you know, the, the storylines were fascinating, and I thought, uh, this is such an American institution, I, I'd better do a story on it. So that's why I did. For many students here in the U.S., amusement parks are a symbol of summer. But what if you got to ride the rides as part of school? One group of students near Washington got to do just that. In the name of science, Susan Logue explains in this week's full story feature, Roller Coaster Physics. It may be hard to believe, but these teens are not skipping school. Today, Six Flags Amusement Park is a physics lab, and riding roller coasters is part of the curriculum. Teacher Sonia Folletti spent the day with some girls from her honors physics class. My teaching philosophy for physics is that they need to see it, touch it, do it. It's, you don't learn physics by listening. Today, they'll experience firsthand what they talked about in class. I use amusement park physics throughout the year. When we're studying acceleration, I talk about Joker's jinx, and we calculate the acceleration because it's zero to 60 in three seconds. Then when we talk about circular motion, we do riddle me this, and we talk about how you, why you feel stuck to the wall. We're not doing another circular ride, right? Folletti's students carry instruments to help them do their own calculations on the rides. This measures G's. This measures centripetal force when we go on the circle rides. A more sophisticated device, worn securely in a vest, records and displays data. The top lines show accelerations. The bottom line shows the barometer reading. You can get the ups and downs of the ride from the barometer readings, and so then you can correlate the, okay, I felt heavy here, oh, that was the dip. Or I felt weightless at this point, I was going over the hill. Jessica Taylor says the experience has made her realize that physics is more than just mathematical equations. Whenever I'm on the ride, I think about the people that had to design it and the engineers that have to do all the math behind it. Do you think I can press it now? Kate Fogarty says knowing the science behind the rides has not made them any less fun. I think it's even more fun, actually, because you kind of get to like, understand what's happening and why you don't fall out of your seat. And that's the main point of this outing. Teacher Sonia Folletti says a trip to Six Flags probably won't inspire many students to become engineers, but at least they will always think of physics whenever they ride a roller coaster. Susan Logue, VOA News, Bowie, Maryland. And that's our show for today. Join us next week when we take a look at elections in Syria and how oil prices could affect your flight plans. You can check us out on the program tab at voanews.com and we're also on Facebook at VOA On Assignment. You'll find our past episodes in both places. From all of us here at On Assignment, thanks for watching.